Um, Vincent, <coughs> Vincent, good evening. Um, I think you need to to make me a horse so that he, so that uh, I'll be able to share. I think my screen. I think I uh, logged in with two devices. One is for audio, the other one is for screen sharing. So you can allow, give me the host ship on screen sharing so that I can share when the time comes. Okay, Doc. Thank you so much. And um, I think our host, Dr. Dwey, can also, uh, our check, Dr. Dwey, can also. <clears throat> Uh, probably, Vincent, maybe you can meet the, the colleagues who, with unmuted mics. Okay, I've muted all the participants except our presenter. So good evening, everyone. Can our participants please register their details to our link that will be shared on our chat window for accreditation of two CPD points. Thank you. Uh, remember to unmute our chair because you might have muted him. Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. It is my pleasure to welcome you to our SOC FITA Medicine CME meeting on this day, 18th of May 2021. My name is Dr. Dube. I'm in Vlawayo, the city of Kings. I'll be your chair in today's meeting. So before we begin, there are just three housekeeping issues that I'd like to bring to your, to your attention. Let us remember to mute our mics as we enter the meeting or during, the, during the, the meeting and have them muted all the time if we are not participating in the, in the meeting. Let us also remember to register our details on the link that has been shared on the, on the chat box. There will be time for questions at the end of the presentation. And as usual, we request that you either raise your hands or you type your questions on the, in the chat box. We will recognize you and our main presenter and speaker will be able to, to attend to those questions at the end. So that leaves me to take this opportunity again to appreciate all of you for having joined us in this CME being hosted by the FITA Medicine Department. Let me take this opportunity to invite our speaker in the CME Dr. C. Verenga, to take us on the approach to the management of torch in, in pregnancy. 
over to you, Dr. Virenga, for the main presentation. You can proceed to share your screen and give us the, the talk. Thank you very much. Th th thank you so much, um, uh, Dr. Dube. And uh, good evening, uh, colleagues. It's always a great pleasure to present at the ZSC, uh, ZSOG Fora uh, in front of colleagues, uh, senior colleagues, and uh, our teachers. So th the reason why I probably chose to present this topic is because I've always felt that it's a, it is a gray area um, uh, which I've often probably come across colleagues whenever they get the results. Some uh, uh, It's never very clear what is it, what is it we should do, uh, what are you going to do with the, uh, this uh, serology test which are positive. So today in my presentation, I'm try, I'll try to sort of give uh, and I probably a, a good guidance as to what to do if you come across um, a positive result from the TOS screening. Of course, I, I will uh, address because probably the debate was already started to say should we be screened for TOS and so forth. I will also address uh, some of those issues um, in my presentation. Uh, this is the outline. Very simple, and uh, my hope is to, to make medicine simple because I always felt that uh, the fathers of medicine conspired to make medicine very difficult by putting a lot of Latin words, which, which I found very difficult to remember during my undergraduate. So I want to, to try and make it simple um, so that it's easy to understand. So it's not just the torch we shall be uh, talking about. I thought it is prudent that we also talk about the new, it's not the new disease on the block, but I think we are aware that uh, the last, it's two years ago, the Zika virus became a topical issue. So I, I've just decided to add it there on the torch. And I've also decided to mention varicella zoster because I believe probably um, some of you will probably come across it while you are looking after a patient. I, I've decided not to talk about herbs because the only thing that herbs does is that if the woman is, has got some uh, um, herb source, that's the only risk that there will be that the baby will be affected. So I've intentionally skipped the herbs, but I will talk about all those other uh, five um, conditions. Um, to start with, I just want to share you with you a case. Of course, um, I'm always grateful to the colleagues uh, who are probably in this meeting, always refer their women, the women they are looking after to me for a second opinion. So I just want to share this uh, case of, uh, of this lady. Actually, she's about 29 years old. She's an administrator. So she came to me in her third pregnancy. Two healthy children are at home. And um, of, of significance, or, or when taking a history, what was of significance is that somehow, somehow the mother, her mother, decided that uh, she went to one of the group A schools. So the mother decided that her daughter is not supposed to get the rubella vaccine. You know, the ones, uh, the one that um, girls get around grade seven, grade six, seven there. So the mother decided that her daughter was not going to have none of this uh, vaccine. So she didn't get it. Um, in, in the pregnancy, she never had any flu, she never had any rashes in the, pre in, uh, in the pregnancy, which she presented with. And um, she had some booking serology tests. Uh, I'm not very clear about the circumstances, why they were to be done. But she told me that around five to eight weeks there, some serology tests were done, that is the TOSH uh, tests were done, and they were all negative. The TOSH screen tests, they were all negative. Um, this is uh, probably expected, because she didn't get any rubella, so you don't expect it to have any antibodies to against rubella. Then, then her doctor, when the <coughs> doctor saw her, uh, the doctor ordered just a routine, as part of a routine practice, uh, the torch. And um, this was around 16 weeks, I think, yeah. And she came back rubella IgM positive and IgG positive. 
And uh, the doctor decided that I think it's better we refer to fetal medicine um, for uh, fetal assessment to see if there is any possibility that um, the baby could have rubella. Um, she had, had an earlier scan, a first trimester scan, which was uh, rather reassuring. Then when she came to see us, we, we assessed the baby. So overall, the baby was growing well and the tummy was fine. There was no evidence of uh, placenta insufficiency at this time. And uh, the head was also measuring appropriately, no microcephaly there. And um, of course, the tummy was just below the, ten, or the, the thigh bone. The femur was just below the 10 cent down, but I decided to, to probably pass it and say, look, uh, it's probably just one of those short femurs in second trimester, who, who, which we pick up, because it was not very short. Just imagine, I think it was about on the 8 cent down. So I passed the growth as normal. Said so this baby is growing appropriately the way baby should grow uh, at 21 weeks. Then, um, because of the his, of a history, I decided that I should proceed and um, do a fetal infection evaluation of this baby, besides just doing a routine uh, anomaly scan. So I embarked on the journey of um, fetal anomaly uh, screening. Uh, so when I um, zoomed on the head, I noted that on the on one of the walls of the ventricle. I could see that there were some sort of punct from calcifications, as you can see there, which, which were rather unusual, because we normally don't see this. Uh, this is supposed to be a smooth uh, walled ventricle, and also um, the first cerebrae shouldn't have all these dots that we see there. see there. The ventricles were OK. They were not dilated. This was less than 10 millimeters. So there was no ventricular megaloma on this baby. But there was just some over prominence of uh, certain structures like the choroid plexus. This is the white structure you see there, the choroid plexus. To me, it was rather over prominent. So I proceeded to uh, lower down the, the gray scale a little bit to see if I could um, see what looked like classification, which I was convinced that probably there is a classification in some area were too echogenic than they should be. So I passed this, uh, uh, this brain assessment as abnormal. I said, look, there are some periventricular calcifications there. Uh, structures are a little bit too bright because the, 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 the coral blister is supposed to be uh, echogenic, but I felt it was too bright. And um, I could also see some, a few calcifications within the brain parenchyma. Then I went on to assess the middle cerebral artery because whenever you suspect infection, you have to be open-minded of everything. Because all infections have a potential of causing fetal anemia. We know the biggest culprits are probably CMV and the parvovirus B, but uh, you never know. So I went on to check the middle cerebral artery. I plotted on the perinatology there and the middle, the, the multiples of median was normal. Then I said, look, there's no fetal anemia. I also plotted on the FMF um, uh, normal ground for MCA, and it was within normal range. I said, look, the baby doesn't have fetal anemia. Then I went on to assess the liver. And um, this is the liver. Uh, this is more of um, the measure at the sort of parasitical plane at the level of the gallbladder, baby's gallbladder. So I measured it, and uh, this Measurement was 27 millimeters, which according to these normograms, uh, done by these guys here, uh, I felt that the liver was probably within normal, I was in convinced there was a hepatomegaly. The same with the spleen, uh, the length of the spleen which I measured corresponded nicely uh, to some of the published normograms. So I passed that this baby didn't have a hepatosplenomegaly. Then when I looked at the placenta, the placenta looked a little bit dodgy because you can see that there is different uh, echogenicity. It's supposed to be a homogeneous structure. Homogeneous, that means the appearance is supposed to look the same throughout the placenta. But you can see that there is a uh, difference in echodensity of this structure here, which looks hypervascularized, and the overall thickness of the placenta was abnormal. A placenta which measures more than four centimeters is referred to as placentomegaly. So I concluded that this baby indeed 
is placentomegaly. Um, then um, when I looked carefully, I noted that there were some parts from calcification to so the placenta. You see this dot, this is 21 weeks, by the way. All, most placentas, it's term, they will have calcifications, but you are not supposed to see calcifications at, um, at 21 weeks. That will be premature uh, aging of the placenta if it does happen outside uh, suspicion of, uh, of fetal infection. So the way comes from calcifications on the placenta, and I concluded that this placenta was by no means normal. So this was an abnormal placenta. I looked at the eyes. What we see there are the uh, eye lenses. They look normal. There is no evidence of for pacification. So there was no cataract here. The bowels, they were a little bit on the borderline because in this image, I didn't lower enough the gray scale, but I didn't think um, the bowels were that echogenic. So I didn't pass them as echogenic. Um, then when I looked at the liver of the baby, this is all part of its screening for fetal infection. When I looked at the liver, then I saw these white dots, which just appear like um, the vertebral bones here, which shows that there is calcifications within this baby's liver. So this is the summary of, uh, of the, the fetal medicine evaluation. Uh, the baby was appropriately grown, an AGA baby, and the Dopplers of this baby were normal. Then uh, there were periventricular calcifications, intracranial calcification, intrahepatic calcification, placentomegaly, uh, with also with calcification. So the diagnosis was symptomatic fetal infection, likely rubella. Um, then the next management plan, some may wonder and say, but why, did, why didn't you go ahead and do uh, an AVDD test? Uh, I'll explain why. In this case, the AVDD test was not indicated because uh, she had a prior torch screen, which was negative. And she came back with both an IgM and IgG positive. So there was no need for me to do an AVDD test. I'll explain the role of, of AVDD test uh, in a moment. So the main management plan was to offer the woman amnio, amniocentesis, so that we could uh, look for, um, for rubella, do a PCR, uh, DNA PCR, rubella DNA PCR in the amniotic fluid. Unfortunately, um, we couldn't find a local laboratory that, will, <laughs> that um, uh, uh, could commit to transport the sample and bring it back on time. So we proceeded to cancel the woman that look, there is now a highly likely that the baby is affected and we canceled it um, concerning conservative management versus termination of pregnancy in view of the above findings. Um, I will conclude the case, this is the end of the case. Um, and I want to continue now to outline some of the principles behind uh, touch um, infection. First of all, the common question that will come to the mind of everyone is to say, should we offer routine uh, screening for torch uh, or not? Um, this is a question probably which is out there for debate, but uh, what is the principle behind? Um, when, you, when you decide that you want to offer torch screening for a pop in a national is a national protocol. There are certain uh, criteria that should be met. Of course, um, we should make sure that torch itself becomes a screenable condition, uh, meet the criteria for a screening condition, which I'll just show you just now. So torch may be offered as a part of a national screening program, especially if the level of seropositivity in a population is known, which is a little bit unfortunate that in our situation, we don't know the seropositivity uh, of the torch uh, viruses in our population. So it may be a little bit tricky to institute a national program of uh, screening every woman for torch. Uh, probably <coughs> what I know what, which was being screened was syphilis, which probably meets the screening criteria of a condition, uh, syphilis rather than the torch uh, panel of viruses. Uh, however, touch can also be done in the context of maternal symptoms, 
uh, where the woman may uh, tell you that, look, I came across uh, school kids and um, I'm really worried that I could have rubella or any of the, uh, the CMV, uh, any of the, uh, the torch. The woman can still be offered or flu-like symptoms or maculopapular rashes. The woman could be offered cream for torch. Or, or if the woman tells you that they've come into conduct with another individual who, individual who is infected uh, with one of the viruses, that is a reason to decide to screen for torch. Or the discovery of an ultrasound marker or abnormality, I'll show you what those markers are, which if you do come across them, you may need to consider ordering torch. Um, however, in private practice, I know some offer it routinely, uh, whenever practice is individualized, there is no wrong or right practice in individualized uh, 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 patient care. Because what matters is that the patient who is being looked after has been given adequate information and understands um, what is happening to your care. That is what matters in individualized care setting. But in the context of public health uh, practice, routine screening has to meet probably the following uh, criteria. Uh, whenever you decide to screen a condition, you have to meet uh, this criteria, which we uh, described by Wilson and uh, Jangna since 1968, um, which I believe probably torch, because we, we do not have figures, we don't have numbers uh, in our population of how much of these conditions do exist in our population. We do not even know the seropositivity of TOGS or CMV. We, we don't know all of that. Uh, on top of that, from the data we are gathering so far in, uh, in, uh, in the fetal medicine unit, units, and also the ones we are gathering in fetal clinic, it is, not, it is actually most, the majority of women are not being offered the torch screen uh, in, uh, with the current practice. Very few women actually are actually being offered torch screen routinely um, for their pregnancy care. To just summarize, what do these conditions cause generally? Um, one of the convincing issues or when it comes to screening for this condition, what it means is that you might end up uh, chasing everyone because the majority of them, as you can see here, they are asymptomatic. They do not cause anything. So the woman can actually have the condition, but she will not have any symptoms. But for those who do have uh, symptoms, this is what is commonly, they will commonly present with. Uh, you can see that there was always, there's almost a mirror of the symptoms. Um, of course, there may be some uh, distinguishing features like varicella uh, zota virus, which we are all are familiar with, with those vesicular rashes uh, and so forth. But there is almost um, cross uh, Cross cutting, the, the symptoms are almost cross cutting most of these viruses um, that we come across. Uh, like I've already mentioned, that in terms of routine screening, there are countries that are offer routine screening. I know France is one of the countries that offer routine screening because their seropositivity is very high uh, for most of these conditions. There are two countries where rubella vaccination is not widespread. In those countries, still have problems with rubella. So those countries can still go on and offer. Uh, routine screening for pregnant women. And however, like I've already said that sometimes in individual SK, uh, the, a practitioner may decide to offer the patients uh, routine screening for torch when they come for their booking blood. In terms of fetal diagnosis, the mainstay of fetal diagnosis to do amniocentesis, then you do uh, a PCR uh, of, the, of the relevant um, virus DNA. Uh, except Zika, which needs uh, reverse uh, transcriptase PCR. Uh, that's the one we, uh, which is a little bit different from the others, but the ma majority um, is just uh, DNA of uh, PCR in the amniotic fluid. Uh, in terms of uh, ultrasound, uh, what we know is to do with, uh, um, with the CMV, that the ultrasound together with MRI, especially if you want to rule out um, CNS involvement, the sensitivity is very good, so as well as the uh, specificity. I think my slide is too big there. There's a specific down there, which is about 93%. Uh, this uh, because of this very good sensitivity, 
ultrasound, both good sensitivity and specificity, ultrasound plays a very big role in the diagnosis of the uh, fetal infection in these conditions. And the principles, the main principles of management, if you are faced with a patient with a, you have screened for torch, let's take a scenario where you have done a maternal serology test, um, which is positive. It could be IgM uh, positive and IgG positive, or IgM negative or Ig positive. Um, if it is like this, it will be considered a positive serology test. Uh, some may wonder and say, um, Ig positive, Ig positive. Uh, one, one of the things to do with the IgM in, in all the, these virus infections that uh, it does not follow the, the usual pattern that we are used to, to say in an acute infection, you are going to have an elevation of the IgM antibodies, then they will probably disappear and then the IgG will come. But in the torch group of virus, sometimes some of the IgM actually persist for a very long time. So Ig, the presence of IgM, both IgM and IgG positive result, in the absence of a prior negative result, does not necessarily mean that this is an acute infection. I think I need to repeat this point. So the presence of an IgM positive result and an IgG positive result, um, while it points to the, to the presence of an infection, it does not necessarily mean that it is an acute infection because some of the IgM can actually persist for more than a year. Because of that, we need to go to the, to the next step. So if you do get this result, the next step is to do an avidity test. Uh, what is an avidity test? An avidity test um, is that test that is checking the net antigen binding of the antibodies. Uh, there is a slide that will explain, it, explain the avidity, but we want to say how strong is the binding of these antibodies to the antigen. And uh, this affinity changes uh, from the period of infection as time goes on. I'll, 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 I'll describe the trend just now. So if you get an IgM positive or IgM negative and an IgG positive, the next step you want to take, and you don't have a prior um, negative serology result, the next test is the avidity test. Why the avidity test? The avidity test um, will allow us to determine the approximate gestational age of infection. The touch group of virus, let me say, is relatively innocent to the mother, probably except virus like varicella, which may cause very bad pneumonias. But the majority of them, they do not really affect the mother. But what we are worried about is the affection to the baby. So we want to know when exactly is it likely that this baby was exposed to the virus. The gestational age of exposure is the one that determines the risk of intrauterine transmission, as you will see uh, on my further slides. Then if the avidity test comes back um, uh, positive, I'm showing, it that, uh, showing the evidence that probably the infection is uh, happened within the current pregnancy period, not outside the pregnancy, then there is need to refer for a fetal medicine scan. If there is no vitamin C scan, then you need a, at least a level two scan that looks at in detail at the baby. Um, then if at the vitamin C scan, the baby is symptomatic, then there is need to offer the woman an amniocentesis. But the amniocentesis has to be done at least eight weeks. Of course, it varies. Some you need four weeks, some six weeks, but I've just put eight weeks to try and summarize all of them. It has to be offered at least eight weeks from the infection because that's when the virus is likely to appear in the amniotic fluid. Um, and it should not be done less than 18 weeks because the virus we test in the amniotic fluid is excreted from the fetal P and the fetal P excretion is maximum from 18 weeks onwards. 
So if we were to do it earlier than that, we may have a false negative result because we have done it too early. So then if indeed there is a positive result from the, uh, of the DNA, uh, PCR from the amniotic fluid, then the management uh, it has to become expectant versus termination after canceling the mother of the potential um, risks to the baby uh, who is affected in terms of the long-term outcome, the neurological outcome of these babies. Then if the fetus is asymptomatic, they say you've referred to a fetal medicine scan and there is absolutely nothing on the scan suggestive of infection, there is a need for continuous surveillance because as long as there is a positive result, there is a possibility that the baby can still be infected during the intrauterine life. So there is a need for continuous surveillance. Of course, if the woman is anxious and the woman really wants to know, uh, is it possible that the infection, because we could have infection, evidence of infection, the amniotic fluid, which is not yet showing on the uh, scan, an amnio can still be arranged for the woman to, 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 to calm it down if the result is negative, or to confirm that there is fetal infection, which is not just manifesting on the ultrasound um, if, um, if the result uh, is positive. Um, in doing all this, we always have to remember that the placenta acts as a barrier, both as a barrier and as a reservoir for infection. While the placenta may protect babies, this is the reason why not all babies with infected mothers will end up with infection because the placenta is there as a barrier. But the placenta can also be a reservoir, uh, acts as a reservoir of infection. That means a baby who gets it in, uh, a woman who gets transplacenta infection now may not necessarily uh, transmit the, the infection to the baby right away, but it can still happen along the pregnancy because the infection will still be in the placenta. The avidity test. Um, the avidity test, like I've already said, that this is uh, the net antigen binding force of the antibody. Say, so how strong are the antibodies binding to the antigen? Um, it is initially low, initially low uh, after primary um, infection or antigen challenge, but increases during the subsequent weeks and months um, uh, uh, after infection by antigen driven beta uh, B cell selection. So, what does this mean? What it means is that if infection is recent, if it is a recent infection, it's highly likely that the avidity test is show, show, going to show a low avidity. If the infection is chronic, is old, if it is an old infection, the avidity is going to be high. What is the importance of this? If a woman comes to you and they are four months pregnant and they have these serology tests which are positive and you do an avidity test and all it shows you is that there is a high avidity test, it is likely that the infection is okayed outside pregnancy and the risk to the fetus is low. If, if the woman comes to you probably in second trimester, and the avidity is low, it is highly likely that probably the woman is, has been affected in first trimester, and this affects the counseling process. You say, what is it we are going to tell the woman in terms of the risk of transmission of the virus to the baby? However, the avidity test will have challenges of interpretation in third trimester. More so if the result uh, is a high avidity test. If it is high avidity test, it could mean that um, if it is six months old, more than six months old, it could mean that the infection happened at eight weeks and the woman is now 36 weeks. So this result is very difficult to interpret if, if it is done in third trimester. It is easier to interpret the avidity test in the first and second trimester and allows for proper women counseling um, because of what I've just mentioned. Then if a, if a woman um, is immunocompromised, then the avidity response is going to be affected so that even when you expect a high avidity, it will still be a low avidity. So this therefore follows that this test has a low applicability in immunocompromised patients. 
The question now is, why avid chase? I've already mentioned that the reason why we are doing avid chase is because the presence of an IgM or IgA antibodies does not always mean that the infection is acute. Well, some of them persist even for more than one year. So in other words, we are trying to predict the actual gestational age of exposure because this is what determines the risk of uh, fetal uh, transmission and also the actual risk of neurological uh, morbidity. Um, I think probably I've already mentioned, I've, I'd summarize the IgM, the IgG um, in, this, um, um, in this table here to just show you that the IgM, <coughs> well, it is an important test to do, but uh, it is not very useful in how we are going to manage the patient. The most important uh, result you want is the IgG, which should be, fo should be followed by the avid test. And, and a positive IgM and IgG works better in the situation of the case which I presented to you, where somehow, somehow, I don't know for what indication, at eight week, around five to eight weeks of pregnancy, the woman had a, a screening test for, for torch, which was negative. If that is the scenario, then in that case, there won't be much need for, for the avidity, unless if probably she, she was to be done this test in third trimester, then we'd want to know roughly when did the test, when did the infection okay. But if it is within three, four months, then there is no need for you to do the avidity test. This is what the avidity tests mean for different conditions. If it is low in the case of CMV, that is less than 30%, that means the infection is less than three months. So you can calculate from the gestational age that, you, that your woman has and peg and say at least the woman was affected at 12 weeks, 16 weeks, or 20 weeks. This, this is an um, effect in how we are going to cancel the woman and also discuss the potential risks to the baby. If the avidity is reported as a high, greater than 60%, that means the infection uh, is, uh, is greater than three months, sorry about this, should be greater than three months, or it could be just a secondary infection. Then for toxo, if it is low, that means less than four to five months. Then if it is high, it's greater than four to five months. Then for rubella, if it is less than three months, um, if it is low, it is less than three months. Then if it is high, it is greater than three months. And um, for Zika, there is, for now, there is not much information on the avid test in Zika virus, and um, it is not necessary in varicella. Because varicella diagnosis is mainly clinical because of the maculopapular rash that we, we, we are familiar with. Um, in secondary infection, sometimes IgG could be false positive, and these are the cases that will need um, amniotic fluid um, uh, confirmation in the cases in the case of CMD. Um, to, to just summarize this slide again, to say IgG is one of the most important uh, serology marker which we have to look at. If IgG is positive, it is always important to follow up with the serology test because pregnancy is carried for quite a, a, a long duration, which is about nine months. So it is possible for someone to get infection and the IgM could disappear and only remain with an IgG after being infected in the first trimester. So it is important that we, 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 we be cognizant of this. Then for, for those who scan babies or those who read the scans, what are the, some of the features of um, fetal infection? They're not necessarily um, uh, specific to only fetal infection because we could see all this with other conditions as well. But if the baby has got ventriculomegaly or calcifications or interventricular senechia or some cerebral uh, abnormalities such as vein hypoplasia, cerebral hemorrhage, calcification, cysts, periventricular pseudocysts, malformations of cortical development, um, these are neuronal migration disorders, and uh, also the uh, lysencephaly, oligo, these are all neuronal migration disorders which I'll, which I'll probably skip for the benefit of the of the most audience which are here, which are obstetricians. Then of course, microcephaly, small head, 
Then uh, the extra abdo uh, uh, cranial abnormalities, uh, small for just not age, hyperechogenic bowels, hypatomegaly, splenomegaly, liver calcifications, ascites, pericard diffusions, skin edema, eye drops, or fetal anemia. So these are the signs that if we do suspect that there is a potential of fetal infection due to positive ser serology, and then a vetted test that suspects that probably infection occurred during the intra, during the pregnancy period, this is what a scan, uh, the scan should look or thoroughly focus on to look for the evidence of uh, the, 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 the presence of these uh, features on the ultrasound. I hope you can see, uh, you can see this uh, table. I've tried to summarize all of them here again. Let me see, how, how can I get rid of, uh, can I? No, I can't, right. So th these are the incidences which are quoted in, in various literature, some of them which are listed below there, the incidence of these conditions. Um, you can see that probably CMV is probably the most commonest um, uh, listed uh, co condition amongst the torch group. Uh, that also includes the, the, the varicella, which is 3,000, and uh, Toxo, which is about two uh, to 500,000. And the main morbidities, uh, which, are, which these conditions are associated with on the fetus, are the following neurological disabilities, central neural neuro, neuro, neuro hearing loss, deafness, is associated with um, CMV infection. Uh, then we have, uh, uh, with Toxo, we can have microcephaly, hydrocephalus, ventriculomegaly, retinitis, sometimes causing blindness. Uh, this condition can also be associated with cataracts on ultrasound, and you could have developmental delays and epilepsy and uh, blindness. Then with the rubella, we could have hearing loss as well, learning disability, heart malformations, and eye defects. Why do we have to know this, uh, <laughs> these conditions? For patient counseling, so that the woman, the woman will ask you and say, what is the effect of this condition, of this touch, uh, or this rubella, this cytomegalovirus on the baby that I'm carrying? Uh, they could also have microcephaly, uh, calcification, brain atrophy, absent corpus callosum, and uh, intraocular calcification, macrothermia, and ventriculomegaly. Uh, this is with Zika virus. Um, Zika virus is not a new kid on the block, but I think it gained prominence in the last few years. Then we could also have um, microcephaly with varicella, hydrocephalus, limb defects. Uh, fetal growth restriction, some soft tissue calcification. In terms of transmission, what is the overall risk of transmission for some of these conditions? Um, the overall transmission for, the pri for primary infection for CMV is about 30 to 40 percent. It varies with just not age, as you will see. Then for toxo is about 20 to 50 percent. Uh, then for, 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 for rubella is about 5 percent. And uh, for these conditions, it's not very clear in the literature what is the overall uh, risk of transmission if the woman indeed has, has got this infection. And this is how the transmission varies with the gestational age. This is the reason for doing the avid test so that you can cancel the woman properly and so that also as a practitioner, you know what is the potential risk to the baby if the baby is infected, if the mother is infected in the first trimester, second trimester, and third trimester. So the trend you can observe is that the risk for CMV increases with the, with the increase in just age of infection. So if the woman is infected in first, uh, third trimester, the chance of passing on to the baby may be as high as 78%. Then uh, this, this is the trend we see with the others as well. This is uh, for Toxo. Again, you can see that in, in third trimester, the risk is greater than 60% that the baby could also be infected. And um, this is for rubella. And for rubella, it's actually opposite others. So, so for rubella, the earlier uh, the, uh, the infection of the mother, if the mother is infected in first trimester, the risk of transmission to the baby is about 90%. Probably this explains why our case, it, does, uh, it was symptomatic uh, because she had a first trimester exposure. 
then it reduces as the, the, the additional age increases. Uh, then for Zika, it's not very clear again in the literature what are the actual figures uh, depending on the uh, uh, on the on the tri trimester. Then for the varicella, uh, it's very low in first trimester, about 0 0.5 and about 2 percent. However, if the woman is infected in uh, third trimester, there is about a 50 percent risk of passing. Uh, on uh, the infection, if it is done, if the woman is infected at 36, uh, at, at 36 weeks of gestation. Then these are the long term uh, impairments associated with the two commonest, which is um, Toxo and CMV, that the long term impairments may be as much as 25% and 90% for CMV and Toxo. So the message is the trimester in which the woman is infected matters. And it needs to be looked for or to be investigated for because it is very important in counseling. Uh, however, there is, there is belief that the earlier the baby is infected, the more the sequela of the infection will be. So that means that for a baby who is infected in first trimester, they are more likely to suffer more impairment compared to a baby who is infected in the third trimester. Um, then, sorry, I'll just skip this and run you down through some of the algorithms for, for these various infections, which I thought they are important. Then I'll come back to the uh, toxo treatment. Then in terms of uh, CMV, if the woman is CMV, cytomegalovirus, and the baby is asymptomatic, uh, asymptomatic, that means there are no features on ultrasound after confirming that the mother is infected after doing the ABG test, serology test positive. What should we do? All we need to do is to offer expected management and uh, of course delivery with the obstetric indication. But however, after delivery, there is need for post-evaluation, postnatal evaluation of the baby for features of infection. And the placenta also has to be examined We've already said that the placenta is a, can act as a reservoir for infection, and um, for positive cases, the baby need to be the baby need to be treated with valacyclovir, and uh, there they has to be a long term follow up if the cases are positive, even if they are symptomatic at the time of the examination. Then, as for CMV infection, um, if the infection is mild or moderate. Um, Valacyclovir can be considered probably all we see on the scan is that probably there's placentomegaly or we suspect that there's polyadramnios. Um, you may decide to treat the mother with valacyclovir in order to go the expected route. Um, in these cases, um, termination of pregnancy should also be raised because of the potential or the, uh, the, the high chance of neurology sequela, which I highlighted on the previous slide. If there's, there are features of severe infection, uh, like some of the ones we saw on our case, uh, termination of pregnancy is a viable option to discuss with the mother. Um, it's not like it's a prescriptive uh, way of management, but the woman has to be told uh, that she can also choose to be expectant, but termination of uh, pregnancy is another viable option which she can choose after understanding, of course, the, uh, the consequences of a, uh, nursing an infected baby. And if this is chosen, then post-mortem examination has to be done, and also the placenta has to be examined. Then for varicella zoster virus, um, if the woman is less than 20 weeks, all that is needed are serial ultrasounds come from five weeks uh, post-infection, uh, then it, this can should be done from at least 16 weeks of gestation. Um, if Infection occurs okay, very early. Then for, for women who are non-immune and they've been exposed, uh, immediately after the exposure, uh, some guidelines recommend that you start uh, the immunoglobin, varicella immunoglobin within 10 days of the appearance of the rash with or without the oral uh, acyclovir for at least um, uh, seven days as a pre-exposure or post-exposure post prophylaxis. Um, then the acyclovir, I've already mentioned that should be started within 24 hours, uh, at least within 24 hours after the appearance of the rash. 
Then the Zika virus, uh, Zika virus, one of the most commonest complication of the Zika virus was to do with microcephaly. I think that was the leading uh, uh, symptom, fetal symptom that was being uh, described in most of the papers to do with uh, uh, Zika virus. So the mainstay of, my, of Zika virus, who should be suspected for Zika virus? We're talking of pregnant women who have traveled to endemic areas such as the South Americas, or those who probably have engaged in, a, in sexual conduct uh, in somebody who has been in a Zika virus uh, endemic area in the last six months. All these women will be at risk of getting Zika virus, and they need to be subjected to a vitamin scan, which can be done every five weeks. And um, if it is normal, of course, in the first uh, scan, it can be repeated in the third trimester, and uh, they, they can be put under surveillance that way. Um, then this is not uh, for, for Zika virus. Um, probably there was a mix up here. But if there are features of Zika virus on the scan, then termination of pregnancy can be offered as an option. There is no medical treatment for Zika virus at the moment. That is to do with the Zika virus. Um, I've put this algorithm for TOXO here because TOXO is such a, a difficult uh, condition to diagnose, even with the serology, because of the difficulties um, of interpretation of the serology of, of TOXO. Uh, the most ideal thing if TOXO is to be screened is to do it in the first trimester. Um, if you do a TOXO serology and both the IgG and the IgM are negative, it is highly unlikely that the woman um, has TOXO. But however, if the woman is a high risk um, case who is exposed to cats and so forth and so forth, then it is prudent to always repeat the test again sometime in pregnancy, probably in the late second tri trimester or third trimester, if the woman is at a high risk of exposure. Um, then if the IgM, if IgG is positive and IgM is negative, and this is less than 18 weeks. Um, in this case, it is likely that probably uh, infection is an old infection, which was uh, acquired in the past. But however, if, the, if it is positive after 18 weeks, it is now difficult to establish whether it occurred during this pregnancy or it is a past infection. So in, in these cases, uh, there's need to go on and do an avid, uh, an avid test and probably to refer again for further uh, tests that, that are to do with trying to predict uh, the actual time of uh, toxo infection. Then we have a scenario where the IgG is negative and the IgM positive, because most of the IgM of these um, viruses can cross-react with other viruses. You could have a false positive result because there is another virus, the dengue can also cause it. So because of this, it is important to repeat again the, uh, the serology in one to three weeks. And if it, if it comes back again with the IgM negative, IgG negative and the IgM positive, um, in this case, you can ignore the result and assume that this is a, a false positive um, IgM uh, result. However, if it comes back now as positive IgG and uh, IgG and IgM, then you can assume that seroconversion is okay and infection is okay in this pregnancy, and there is need to commence the woman on treatment and, of course, for a vitamin uh, scan to be done on this woman. Then, if it is just a single test that you have done, which is IgG positive and IgG uh, positive and you have not yet uh, this kind of result before, this result is always difficult to, uh, to confirm. In our setup where we do not have reference laboratories for conditions such as TOXO, probably it is safe to assume that this woman is in this category and they are offered a fetal ultrasound uh, which look for symptoms or signs of infection. If these signs are, are negative, then probably a surveillance can be put in place. If they are positive, then uh, toxic infection can be assumed and an amnio, amniocentesis can be offered to diagnose the condition. 
Um, I think this I've summarized it with the algorithm. Let me just come back to the treatment as is recommended by, by the ESO guideline. Uh, the management of toxo has always been challenging and always uh, been debatable, but uh, this is what is recommended by ESO that if you happen to confirm that indeed there is toxo, what should you do? Um, you should give spiramycin uh, one gram uh, uh, orally three times a day until the end of pregnancy. Um, if it, there is evidence that there is no vertical transmission, um, that is, if the mother is positive and we've done the scan, the scan is normal, and probably we've done even in amnio and the amnio is normal. If there is evidence of vertical transmission, the recommended treatment is to put the woman on spiramycin for one week, then which will be followed again by um, pyrimethamine uh, with these doses uh, as well today, and also sulfadazin and the folinic acid. Um, and the baby, uh, the, the treatment has to be throughout the pregnancy, and uh, the, also the baby has to be treated for further one year according to these recommendations. Um, yeah. So I think this will be more of my last slide on the infection. I've already mentioned that TOXO is very difficult to interpret. We do not have a reference laboratory for TOXO. So an IgG positive, uh, IgGm and IgG positive result should be assumed to be uh, a TOXO infection and should be referred accordingly. This is just to show the likelihood um, of fetal infection uh, which varies with the senior age for these two uh, kind of conditions uh, from the data I got from the literature. Um, for CMV, if the, if the woman is infected uh, preconception around the time of falling pregnant, there is about 70% chance that there is going to be severe infection after birth of the baby. Um, then if it is in second trimester, 20%, and um, uh, first trimester, 20%, and second trimester about 5%. These are the figures for rubella. So while it is true that uh, the risk of transmission probably is, in, increases with gestational age, but the severity of the infection actually lowers with the gestational age uh, of infection. Thank you very much. This is my last slide. Thank you for, for listening. I'll open the room for, uh, I'll hand over to the chair. Just okay, thank you very much, Dr. Virenga, for, for such an insightful talk on torchy in on the management and the approach of torch infections in, in, in pregnancy. Uh, I'm sure colleagues on this meeting were able to, to, to understand one or two things and also to be able to understand most of these uh, algorithms that we're able to put across to, to us. So right now, I will allow for, for questions. So if there are any questions, there are two ways you can do it. You can either raise your hand and we'll recognize you, and then you can proceed to ask your questions and Dr. Virenga will answer, or you can even type it in the, in the chat box. So maybe as colleagues are, are doing that, I will use my privilege as chair of the meeting to ask the, the first question. Uh, Dr. Virenga. Mm -hmm. we, we know that uh, sometimes confirmation of a fetal infection does really not necessarily mean that the fetus will be affected by the pathogen. And uh, on the other hand, we also know that, uh, that even those fetuses that do not exhibit any imaging abnormalities may still suffer long-term sequelae or cons consequences. So, the, and this is usually very difficult to, 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 to predict. So I wanted to find out how then do you decide on the subsequent follow-up to offer to, to these women, knowing, like, knowing that uh, really the confirmation of fetal infection may not necessarily mean that the baby is going to have sequelae, but also knowing that even those fetuses that may not show any abnormality on scans may actually suffer some long-term consequences. So it's like a, a two-edged sword. So my question really is, is how <coughs> are you going to be able to cancel these women and structure their subsequent follow-up? Thanks. Thank you, thank you so much, Dr. Dewey. Um, One of the reasons why I put this slide here is to, to just show you what is reported on the literature for some of the conditions. I couldn't find the data, 
for some of these other conditions to say, what is it you have to tell the mother? But if you check, for example, for CMV, um, <coughs> if there is evidence that the fetus is infected, uh, I have to tell the mother that uh, there is a 25% risk that your baby will have long-term um, impairments. And you have to tell you that, look, there is a chance that your baby will have problem of deafness and will have some other neuro neurological disability uh, on your baby. And this chance is about 25%. However, this chance can also vary depending on what is affected because some of the infection can be so damaging to the baby so that uh, just beside the, uh, uh, the neurological issues, there could be um, probably severe fetal growth restriction and also hypoxia. So this number can also change depending on other comorbidities which are caused by the infection, number one. Then as for this asymptomatic, you are right that uh, um, it is a very difficult, uh, like I said from the beginning, the area is too gray to say, if the woman is serological positive and we don't find anything on the scan, Number one. Number two, you offer the woman amniocentesis. We do amniocentesis in, in the FMUs or the FMUs. Uh, there's the somebody who asked the question. If you, if you find that there is nothing, it is very difficult to cancel the woman, but the woman has to know that if we don't find anything, it does not mean 100% that their baby, is, they, their baby is not infected because the amniocentesis itself is not 100% in terms of detecting um, uh, the, the, the babies who are infected. So we have to tell the woman these words, this kind of information. It's a very difficult uh, form of counseling uh, where the results are negative, but the woman is positive. However, because of the specificity for some of the condition, if you remember, I, I showed you a, a slide. Um, I think my slide is too big. Maybe, let me come out of Zoom, out of uh, full, uh, full slide. Let me show you some of the, one of the slides that is showing the numbers. So the negative predictive value of an ultrasound is, is about 93%. So that means if the ultrasound scan finds no more findings, that is an ultrasound scan done within or at the level of the fetal medicine uh, services, is about 93%. So this is what you have to tell the woman that, look, the chance that your baby will be fine is so high. However, we still have a 7% chance that if we tell 100 women that there's nothing on scan, seven of them may end up having problems after reassuring them this way. But 93% is very high in terms of uh, the negative predictive value of ultrasound. And also we take note of the sensitivity there, that the sensitivity is also not bad of uh, ultrasound in terms of picking up features of infection, especially if done serially throughout the pregnancy all the way to term. I hope I've answered you. Yes, thank you very much, Dr. Dr. Veringa. Maybe before we take the next question, may I remind participants that please do not leave the meeting before you enter your details on the link that has been shared on our, on our chat box, that will enable you to get your, your CPT points. Let me recognize, I don't know, I've seen uh, Dr. Nyakura send up, I'm not sure if he's, he has lowered it down, but if he's in the meeting, he can go ahead and, and ask his question. Thank you, Dr. Jube. Um, thank you, Dr. Veringa, for such an insightful presentation on, uh, on uh, torch, torches infections. My, I've got uh, three questions for you. The first question is on the case that you presented. What was the indication? Oh, sorry. What was the indication for the repeat screen when the patient had, had a negative test within just uh, two months? <laughs> then the second question, is on uh, your thoughts now after having gone through this presentation and the research you have done do you think it is prudent for us to do routine screening i didn't i didn't really feel a commitment on your presentation on whether we should do routine screening of the the torch infections the last question 
we see quite a lot of pregnant women with this syphilis and you didn't want to include them in the we've always known that the torches infection includes the virus plus the syphilis so i didn't see you commenting on syphilis in this presentation was this was this deliberate or there is a reason for that um thank you thank you michael to be honest i thought syphilis is a conga disease the reason why I said I want to do the presentation, I wanted to address some of the challenging issues to do with the, with the serology of, of these uh, viruses. But, so I thought syphilis was a congat disease. This is why I didn't want to, to, to bother you with, because I thought it's a congat disease. People know what to do with syphilis. Uh, then um, the second one is to do with why was it done? I think you, you are aware that sometimes when women book, first of all, they book probably with their GPs, but some or some when they go to the obstetricians, obstetricians may still uh, order another panel uh, of screening tests by the time they present themselves to the obstetrician. So I'm thinking probably this is what happened to this lady uh, who ended up uh, coming to me. So probably she was done this first screening by the GPs. We sometimes they may not present uh, uh, with the result to their doctors. And their, some doctors offer this routine to their patients. I've already explained that um, uh, for individualized care, it is what you, the, the package you want to give to your patients, uh, which, which determines what you do. Uh, if, because this is not public uh, health care, if it is individualized price, uh, private care. Then in terms of, should we offer a national screening program for torch? I've already mentioned that for a national screening program, TORCH in our country may not meet the, uh, the, the uh, public uh, condition screening uh, criteria because we don't know a lot of things about TORCH uh, in our population. We need data uh, for us to be able to say, let's offer it depending on the seropositivity, how many women are the numbers need to screen to just pick up one case. We don't know all this kind of information. So in terms of saying should all government patients have touch, I don't think we have adequate information to say that. But for individualized care practice, being from fetal medicine, I'll be super excited if people offer their uh, women touch, because it will make uh, triaging of etiology very, very simple. Well, sometimes you see these conditions, we are saying is there fetal infection or not, but if somebody has never been done a touch, now we have to start ordering torch. More so in our setup where uh, fetal growth restriction is so common, uh, so that especially in government, we end up calling every fetal growth restriction placenta insufficiency. Yet probably there's also torch underlying on those fetal growth restriction. So personally, I'll be happy uh, if um, individualized uh, practice, uh, people offer routine torch, was it will make it easier for etiological differentiation of some of the fetal complications we see. All right. This is Thank you. Thank you for the response, Dr. Viren. But in terms of public health, it, we don't have enough data to cause such, such a massive uh, shift polygosity is severe consequence in terms of the okay. cost and everything. Great. Uh, thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you very much, Dr. Verenga and Dr. Nyakura for the question and also <coughs> the answer. Uh, I do not see any raised hand for now, so I'll go to the, to the chat box. There's, um, there's a question that says, how do you counsel a patient for future pregnancies if she has had two children, then a stillbirth with multiple cross anomalies? followed by two miscarriages and happens to be CMV, IgG positive, IgM negative. And then it's emphasized that this is the stage just after the last miscarriage. I don't know if you have got the question, Dr. Verenga. Uh, uh, I've got the question. Um, of course, it's not an easy case to cancel from what you've described. Because well, there could be multiple um, challenges there or multiple conditions involved um, in the in this in in the, in the previous in the current pregnancy. 
multiple gross abnormalities. Um, I think we have seen from the from the torch from the features of fetal infection, uh, which I presented here, that fetal infection does not necessarily cause um, multiple morphological abnormalities that can be seen. Um, uh, outside without ultrasound. That means when you examine these babies, there's very little you may see on examining the baby's gross examination of the babies because of the features which we which we describe the uh, because most of these features are seen with, with ultrasound. I don't know, know where the, the, the slide is now. Where is this slide with a fetal? Oops, yeah. So mo most of these features, you're not going to see um, cisencephaly. Of course, you're going to see that the head is microcephaly. So pro and maybe ascites, you're going to see this uh, uh, um, eye drops looking like a ba like baby. But the rest of these structures are hidden from the naked eye. So if you see uh, uh, multiple def gross defects, then we have to think of the chromosome abnormality or a genetic syndrome. That is what may give us multiple gross abnormalities rather than fetal infection. So for, for this woman, uh, it's highly likely that that pregnant that has multiple gross anomalies, they could have been underlying chromosomal or genetic syndrome. Then in terms of the miscarriages and um, torch, two uh, recurrent miscarriages and torch, um, with an I, uh, then with a recent IgG positive and an IgM negative, um, it may it may be difficult to to link this CMV to to the potential of causing the miscarriages. But we are saying it's not the most commonest cause, but it it could be likely. But the thing is, she now is she is now IgG positive and she is not pregnant now. All we have to do for this woman, because uh, we have to do for this woman is to tell her that, look, uh, we can do an IVG test and see how old the infection was. If it is an old infection, we can reassure you that you have an old infection that is more uh, highly unlikely to, uh, to interfere in the next pregnancy. But it, it is very difficult to, to link um, the miscarriage with the first or second, they are not mentioned, to link the miscarriage with the CMV. Because there are other more common causes of miscarriages, but with the with this kind of result, it's very difficult. I'm not going to lie and say it is easy to cancel this kind of a situation. But doing an IVD test, if if it was possible also to to to, to send the placenta tissue uh, during the miscarriage, that could have been done as well. But it's a very difficult case to cancel because linking the CMV to the miscarriage. Is not going to be easy because it's not the most commonest cause of miscarriages. I, 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 I don't know if I've answered this satisfactorily there, but I think that's the best I could do for this kind of question. Thank you very much, Dr. Dr. Verenga. Uh, are there any follow up questions or any other colleague who may be having a question? Please raise your hand so that we may recognize you. I also do not see any, any questions in the, in, the, in the chat box. And I think for now, we're probably exhausted, probably exhausted all the important questions our, um, that came our way. So then that leaves me to hand you over to our administrator, the SOC administrator. And also Dr. Verenga is the chair of the scientific committee. So that if there are any announcements that uh, our members need to be, to be aware of, I think I'll give this time over, over to you. And of course, our, our administrator, if there are any other housekeeping issues to be aware of. Thank you. Um. Th 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 thank you so much, Dr. Dwe. And uh, I don't know if the SG, SG is in, in the meeting, but uh, if the SG in the meeting, he could uh, make some announcement. Dr. Mateveke, are you, are you in the meeting? If the SG is not in the meeting, I think we um, there is a general feeling amongst the, uh, the scientific committee 
that uh, the meetings are too much and uh, they are too congested. So probably, uh, you remember these meetings which are coming every two weeks came after, um, after a survey had been conducted. I think Dr. Madire created a monk survey which was conducted and people agreed that two weekly was probably better because we used to have them every week, but there's now a general feeling that they are probably too many. Um, so we'll ask, we'll, another survey, monk survey will be conducted. We'll be asked to give your input in terms of how frequent should the ZSO gym meetings happen? Um, so this will come to you. Please uh, take your time to complete that survey. Because it will help us to, to deliver the meetings as per demand. Thank you. Thank you for your time and uh, good night. And please keep yourself warm. The weather is getting um, interesting, a little bit colder. Thank you, Dr. Verenga. That, that brings an end to, to our meeting for, for this week. Thank you very much to all participants and all colleagues. Thank you.